So in 2020, there were a lot of people who lost their jobs, went out of work. And fortunately for me at the time, I was a first responder. I was a patrol deputy and a SWAT operator. And so that financial stability was a huge blessing for my family and I. But despite having a stable income, that year was still very stressful. You know, I wasn't able to practice historical fencing, which is a huge part of my life. And my regular gaming group, we completely suspended play. We had tried the virtual tabletop thing and just collectively decided we didn't like it. So I had decided that instead what I was going to do is I was going to work on something that I had been wanting to work on for a long time, which was creating tabletop role-playing game content. And I know that I wanted to create a, a renaissance world that was grounded in history, that was dark and it was gritty. And I really, really wanted to get away from the fifth edition art direction, which I, I really had disliked at the time. In fact, I, looking at the fifth edition products that were, were coming out, I felt that the art was really silly at best and cringy at worst. So I, I knew that I was going to, I wanted to start creating content within a kind of a more serious, historically grounded world. I wasn't sure that if Streets of Peril was going to be a supplement book, like for 5th edition or Dungeon Crawl Classics. You know, ultimately, I decided to create my own game entirely. Uh, but I, just, I knew that I wanted to create, again, something that was uh, with a Renaissance aesthetic uh, that was a little bit more darker, a little serious uh, in tone. And I also knew that regardless of what it is that I created, whatever the nature of it was, whether it was a supplement or it was my own game, I really, really wanted art that reflected the kind of tone that I wanted. And fortunately, in 2020, I was just in a really unique place in my life because I was financially in a really good place. And one of my good buddies, Dylan Smith, um, who's a really successful, talented tattoo artist, he was available for commissions, whereas he's normally swamped with work. But it was 2020, and you can imagine how hard that must have been for a tattoo artist. So the stars aligned, everything fell into place, and I was able to uh, pay for all of the initial artwork for Streets of Peril. And for a lot of people who are trying to create their own tabletop games, I think artwork is probably the biggest barrier and hurdle. Like probably other indie designers, when I was first exposed to AI art, my first reaction to it was, oh wow, this could be an awesome tool and then over time, I started to understand some of the ethical implications of AI art. And you know, ultimately, I decided that I was not going to use any AI art. In fact, if you've ever purchased anything from Broken Blade Publishing, everything in there is human. There's, I only employ human artists. Um, and I'm, I've decided I'm going to commit to only using human artists. Now, if something changes with AI, if, if there's a way in which it can be done in a more ethical manner, I might change my mind, but for the time being, um, I only intend to use human art. And so, you know, I don't want this video to be, I don't want to really get into all the ethical dilemmas surrounding AI art or try to convince you not to use AI art. You know, I, I, there's already lots of really good videos on that subject. What I want to do instead is explain how, in my opinion, there are a lot of ways in which working with humans is way more satisfying than working with AI, and how I think that uh, the, the product that you're going to get from a human is going to ultimately going to be better than what you would get from a machine. So in one area in which this is true is that uh, I can have shared experiences with another human that I can't have with a, with a robot. So for example, you know, Dylan Smith and I, we are both HEMA practitioners. Dylan has, like me, he's handled a sharp sword, he's cut things with a sharp sword, um, he's participated in fencing tournaments, he's worn armor. So when I'm trying to convey things to him, as far as especially like the composition of, of a like, dynamic scene, of a fighting scene, it's very easy for me to explain to him what I want and for him to intuit from that, you know, how the artwork should look. I think it's really important that our artwork provokes emotion. 
that is really, really important for tabletop role-playing game books because for me, when I'm looking at art in a tabletop role-playing game book, like I feel like it should inspire heroism or it should provoke dread or unease. You should look at something and feel unsettled when it's supposed to be sort of creepy and otherworldly. Because you know, when you're looking through a tabletop role-playing game book, it's way more than just the nuts and bolts of the mechanics. It's not just how the game works. It puts you in a sort of emotional state. It makes you feel a certain way. Another thing that I really like about working with artists is that I'm not an artist. So there are certain things that I have in mind um, that when I convey to an artist, hey, I want, I give them the reference images, I tell them what I want, they will give me back concept pieces. And sometimes I will go with the concept piece which is most closely resembles what I had in mind and the, the, and the input that I gave them. But oftentimes, the artist will give me a concept piece which it differs from what I originally had in mind, but does a way, it looks so much better than what I could have come up with because it's an artist coming up with it. And that's amazing. I always love when that happens because there are so much art that is in Streets of Peril, which is the product of brilliant artists that are contributing um, their imaginations and creativity to the product uh, that, you know, that makes the book better than it would be. And that's amazing. I don't think, I don't think AI can simulate that. Um, and then on top of the, all of that is the fact that each artist in the book has a very has their own unique fingerprint that they place on the game. Um, you know, Dylan does really great dark, realistic, heroic pieces of art. Asha Yordanova, she's the the bestiary artist. The way in which she she places her own sort of little twist on all the monsters is amazing. It's wonderful. There's so much. There's so much better than what I could have had in mind. And then on top of it, you know, initially I wanted just, I wanted Streets of Pearl to just be black and white, which was, I came to realize later it was a mistake because how are you supposed to do a Renaissance book without color? Uh, you can't have a book with launch connects without having beautiful, brightly colored launch connects somewhere in your book. And Pavel's uh, use of color is amazing. And so what I really like about Streets of Peril and the final product is that the sum of all the parts is better than each individual piece of art. What I want you guys to do is come away from this feeling inspired to work with human artists. At the end of the day, if you're when we're trying to create games, like I think of the products I create as being artistic products. I want something beautiful in that that my my customers hold and they just love and cherish. And I think that working with other humans is going to allow you to be able to achieve that in a way that is going to be very difficult with AI, if not impossible. So those are my thoughts on AI versus human art. Uh, and ho hopefully you guys enjoy this video. I'll talk to you guys again soon.